Hello, let's now talk about interrupts. So interrupts are signals sent to a processor by a process or a device which require its urgent attention. So if a processor is urgently required to look at something else. Now, let's just break apart that a little bit. So first of all, the word process, we've got for slightly annoying similar words, processor and process. So a process is just a running program. So it's currently in memory, it's being used by the user at some point, and the CPU is kind of actively going to be executing it. So we can think of this as being just software. So therefore, interrupts can be generated by software and also devices. Devices are hardware. Now, one thing which is important to realize for this video and also for the scheduling video, which is next in the playlist, is the different processes have different priorities. Now, what that means is there is some <laughs> level of importance here. Not all processes are equally important. Now, what priority each process has is determined by the operating system ultimately. And how it does this will vary OS to OS. In my imaginary one here, it's a zero to 100 scale, where 100 is most important and zero is basically irrelevant. So closing a tab might have quite a high priority because the user would expect to see the tab being closed as soon as they click on it. Whereas a kind of background check for updates is not as important, that could be delayed if we had to delay it. So we've got loads of normal processes active. The processor, the CPU, is working its way through these different processes. We also have interrupts. So an interrupt is there to enable a processor to respond to critical events. And it will either be a CPU or a GPU which is reacting to these interrupts. Because as we know in life, things can happen. We can have to change our plans a little bit and interrupts enable this to happen. Now each interrupt has a priority as well. There are loads and loads and loads of different interrupts. Not all of them are equally important. They will each have their own priority. A shutdown interrupt might be our biggest priority, but not all of them are quite as important. So going into what we need to know about interrupts further. So when an interrupt occurs, the processor switches to execute the relevant interrupt service routine, ISR for short. So the processor is doing something, it's doing a normal process, Interrupt happens, it switches to execute the ISR, which is a process that will respond to and handle the interrupt. It's a program which just deals with whatever the situation is which has occurred. Now, like I say, there are loads and loads of different interrupts. Some are more important than others. Just to give you some examples of these, both in terms of interrupts generated by software and interrupts generated by hardware, I wanna go through just six examples here. But just to link this to a previous topic though, how does this processor know that an interrupt has occurred? Well, a software interrupt will go via the OS, but a hardware interrupt will go via the control bus. So the control bus, if you can recall, has got multiple different lines. Each Y is representing a different control signal. And one of these will be for an interrupt. So when an interrupt is pending, it will get sent down the relevant interrupt line of the control bus. So the processor is aware that a hardware interrupt has occurred. So you've not got to know these six necessarily, but I think it's important that you have a rough idea of what sort of interrupts can occur and also what the ISR might be doing to handle the interrupt. So in terms of software interrupts, we have what are called system calls. We mentioned this in the operating system video a couple of videos ago. These are like a bunch of subroutines which other applications are able to use in order to get the OS to do something. So a program could require the OS to, for example, open a file. The program can't open a file on its own, it needs the OS to help it. So therefore it launches an interrupt to ask the OS to complete this request. The OS will run the ISR, which handles this. When it's done, it will return it to the main application. Another example relates to certain errors you might find in a program. As you will know from experience, there are lots of different errors which can occur. Some are pretty safe and some could cause just a lot of trouble if they manage to slip through the net. And dividing by zero is an example of this. You can't mathematically divide by zero. It potentially would cause a crash. It would potentially cause some erroneous results. It might mean your ALU can't complete a instruction. So we wanna try and stop these happening as soon as possible. So once it detects you are about to divide by zero, an interrupt will be launched then an ISR will just stop whatever you're doing and report to the user an error message. And the third example of a software interrupt is a page fault interrupt. We've looked at what virtual memory is and a page fault occurs when a page is needed but is actually in virtual memory. 
So you try and access a page, but it's actually not there. It's not where the logical memory says it is. It's actually physically stored in secondary storage. That is a page fault. And at that point, it will need to interrupt, launch an ISR. The ISR will do that swapping process to get it back into RAM so if we are able to access it directly. Now, the hardware interrupts are maybe a little bit easier to understand because we can picture these a bit more easily. Again, we're just trying to get a bit of background here. We're trying to understand roughly what interrupts could occur and how the ISR could go about trying to handle these. Well, timing in computers is really quite complicated and there are a few different ways you can set a timer or keep track of the time. One of the ways you can do this is via interrupts. So what you could do is you could, after a set number of clock cycles, trigger a timer interrupt. And this could be used to maintain your system time, which is what the user sees usually in the bottom right or top right of their screen. So for example, after 10 milliseconds worth of clock cycles, you could trigger an interrupt and the ISR could simply just add 10 milliseconds to the current time. And so over time, it constantly is triggering the interrupt at a regular time interval, meaning you are able to keep time and be super accurate. And it's an example of where we need to interrupt, right? If we put it in the back of our queue and the CPU was busy doing something else, well, it's not going to be an accurate time. What we need to happen is after exactly 10 milliseconds, the CPU stops what it's doing, adds 10 milliseconds to the timer, then reverts back to what it was doing before. We can't afford to be waiting around because it will just mean the time is incorrect. Now, mouse interrupts occur whenever you move your mouse. And we use interrupts here because the alternative to using an interrupt for this would be we are just constantly monitoring the movement of the mouse. And personally, I've just sat here with my mouse on my desk. I haven't moved the mouse in a few minutes. There's no point constantly checking what I'm doing. It's far better to, as soon as I move it, send a signal along the control bus telling the CPU, oh, he's moved the mouse. Let's now listen and follow the movement and show on screen the cursor moving. So when the mouse is just sat there, the CPU is doing something else. The second I move it, we trigger an interrupt. The CPU stops what it's doing. It listens or watches out for whatever is being sent down the buses, representing the movement of my mouse. And the same thing happens with the keyboard. Whenever you type a key, a keyboard interrupt gets triggered so that it can capture that key and then save it in the file. And these are useful examples to have in your head because it demonstrates the point that interrupts aren't always really, really, really important, super, super critical, rare events. Interrupts happen just all the time. They're pretty normal things to happen. Whenever you move mouse or type a keyboard, you are triggering lots of different interrupts. And of course you're shutting down a computer pretty often as well, but that is maybe a much more important time critical interrupt because you wanna shut it down, power's starting to get drained. We press a button and we click for GUI and the ISR has only got a few seconds maybe to try and save any data it can. Then it will slowly try and withdraw power from the components in a way which won't damage them and will be done safely. So interrupts are pretty standard. They happen all the time. We need to be able to now in a bit more detail, go through the exact steps our CPU goes through in order to handle the interrupts. And I say it's what the CPU does. Of course, we are looking at the operating system as a topic here. The operating system is managing the CPU. So really it's the OS which is overseeing this process, but a lot of the stuff we're talking about relates to the CPU. So there's a very set set of steps we've got to go through here. So to handle interrupts, what do we do? Well, at the end of an FDE cycle, the CPU is checking for an interrupt. It's either checking the control bus or it's waiting instruction from the OS if it is a software interrupt. But this is done at the end of the cycle. If there is an interrupt, the priority of the interrupt gets checked. If that priority is not higher than your current process, you need to finish the current process. As a reminder, a process is a running program. A running program might require quite a few different FDE cycles. So you're quite possibly midway through a process. And if this process is more important than the interrupt, fine, we just continue our current process. But sometimes the interrupt will be a higher priority than your current process. In which case, the CPU will switch to execute the relevant ISR. There is a different ISR for every interrupt it will find a relevant one and switch to it. Now, how does it switch to this ISR? Well, what are some of the steps involved here? Well, it will first of all need to store the contents of the current registers in a stack. And the stack is just an area of memory reserved for this purpose. It works like the stack you would have learned about potentially elsewhere in the course. And I'll give you an example of that in a couple of minutes. 
Once we've saved these registers to memory, we are now going to change the program counter to now point towards the relevant ISR in memory. This will enable us to start executing the ISR. It might take quite a few different FDE cycles to do this, but we just carry out whatever the ISR is telling us to do. And when the ISR finishes, we are going to pop the stack. What that means is that we remove the values to restore the original register values. Once I've got my register values back, I'm able to just resume what I was doing and I continue completing the process from before. Now, step one there is so, so important if I want to resume the process of had to pause. I'm effectively just pausing what I'm doing, switching to handle the interrupt. Then I want to be able to go back to what I was doing before. If I didn't save stuff to memory, well, I've got no way of going back to what I was doing beforehand. So I'm afraid these steps are just ones you have to learn for this topic. The questions are always quite predictable. You need to be able to go through these steps in the correct order. So to help you a little bit, let me just try and show you this a bit more visually because it is quite hard to fully get into your head. So we've got our FD cycle, which is done billions of times per second. We check for a pending interrupt right at the end of this cycle. So I don't check midway through. If an interrupt occurs midway through, I don't stop and do it. I just wait until the end of the cycle. Let's imagine this is the current state of my registers. I've put in just made up values here, but, but we've got some stuff in our registers. We're midway through a process, for example. And let's say this process has a priority of 22. So it's not the most important. If 100 is our most important and zero is our least important, it's not the highest priority, but I'm working on it currently. And I've got my stack. So like I said, a stack is just an area of memory, which the OS is reserving for this purpose. Now, if I get to this point, I'm checking for an interrupt. Well, okay, one has occurred. I have found an interrupt. The control bus says an interrupt has occurred. What do I do now? Well, first job is to check the priorities. Let's say this interrupt was me moving my mouse and actually the OS thinks this is relatively important. It has a higher priority from what I'm doing currently. So therefore my current process is going to have to be paused. I'm going to have to save these register values in memory. Now I would be saving all of these values in memory. I just can't fit all of them in. So I've put PC and ACC, arguably the two most important ones in my diagram, but all of these would be saved to the stack. So they're safely in memory. What do I do now? Well, I need to switch to executing the ISR. I would need to look probably in RAM to find this ISR. An ISR is just a program which handles whatever I'm doing. I need to find this ISR. Let's say this ISR starts at location 92. I need to change my PC to point towards this ISR. So therefore my PC is now being set to 92 so that I can start executing this ISR. I just go through. At the end of each FD cycle, I still will check for interrupts, but so far none are occurring. Keep going through, but eventually Look what's happened, I've hit another interrupt. So I'm currently handling the first interrupt, a mouse interrupt, but now another interrupt has occurred. And that's quite important to realize, an interrupt can interrupt an interrupt, as confusing as that sounds. So what do we do? Well, we go through the same steps again. We check the priority of this interrupt, first of all. Now this interrupt is a timer interrupt, which the OS has deemed more important. So 90 beats 85. So therefore, the current ISR is going to have to get paused to run this timer interrupt ISR. Well, what are the steps involved here? I first of all save the contents of my registers to the stack. I then look in memory for the next ISR for this current interrupt. This, let's say, is at location one. So I set the PC to point towards the location of this next ISR. I can then just plow on and continue executing this ISR at the end of each cycle, checking for more interrupts. Let's say no interrupts occur in this process. I eventually hit a halt command. A halt command will just end this program. So therefore this ISR is finished doing whatever it is doing. That's fantastic. I can then finish this ISR and move back onto whatever I was doing before. And this is why stack is used as our data structure. The stack is a last in first out structure which means the top item in the stack is always the last thing I was doing beforehand. So we always want to resume in the order I was doing. I want to do this top process first. That's why it's a stack and not a queue. 
So I need to load back in these register values. There we go. They're back in memory now. I can then just continue what I was doing. So this ISR finishes. It does whatever it's doing. Once this ISR hits a halt command, it's done handling the mouse interrupt. And then again, I can look at the stack and pop any remaining process so that I can resume it. I just need to load in these register values again. And once I load these into the CPU again, I can just continue with what I was doing originally. So that's how we handle ISRs. We save the current register to the stack. We then take it off the stack when I want to resume what I was doing beforehand. And that stack is really important so that I don't lose track of what I was doing. It means I don't have to restart all of my different processes whenever they get interrupted.